Larry, thank you very much for joining us today. I know that you don't have to do these talks anymore. You're, you're pretty much done with whatever you have to do downtown. And, you know, I know a lot of people say that, you know, we're rebuilding downtown. Downtown is rebuilt. It's done. You know, your legacy is cemented, right? And I think you deserve a round of applause from everybody here. What you should know is we still have one building to go. Well, yeah, you have two World Trade Center at, that's still unbuilt out of units. You know, that's about 2.8 million square feet. You've managed to get amazing tenants, really progressive tenants who would never look at downtown. People like Spotify, ad agencies. And you've really transformed downtown in a way that nobody thought at the time, especially at the time when the tragedy happened, nobody thought that it could be rebuilt. And now it's become this crystal city of its own. And you know, what I'd like to know is how did you convince those sort of cool, hip companies to move downtown? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that after 9-11, it was obvious that there were a zillion people living around that area and many, many commercial tenants, many occupants. Um, and that the place therefore had to be rebuilt for yet another reason, aside from surrounding circumstances. And that is we couldn't let the terrorists succeed. Right. And by putting the buildings back, we would defeat them. Right. And, that, and that's great. I mean, I think as one of the major landlords, especially commercial landlords in this city, jobs are very important for you, right? The city has to produce jobs. Uh, companies have to grow. I just want you to sort of uh, clear a myth for myself and I'm sure for a lot of other people here that, you know, someone like you, you know, who has so much influence and power over the city, over its government, just because of the amount of investment that you have here and the amount of money that you give into the coffers of the tax revenues every year. Sort of paint a picture for us, because for me, uh, like when the Amazon debacle happened, right? We, we lost Amazon as a major tenant here in the city, which I'm sure as a major landlord in the city, you were not happy with it. And the, the thing in my head is that you see that happening, you pick up your phone and you call the governor. Uh, how did it happen? Did, was the governor your first phone call when you saw the debacle happen? And what did you say to him? Okay, the governor was not my first call and therefore I won't tell you what I said to him. <laughs> <laughs> my second or third, but not my first. Uh, but thinking back to the circumstances surrounding the loss of Amazon, uh, that was singularly unfortunate. Um, number one, Amazon still has an enormous presence in New York today. The presence out in Long Island City would have added to that significantly. The unfortunate thing is that the programs that had been offered to Amazon were all programs existent at that time and existing today. Uh, there was nothing new about the proposals to Amazon. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, I think there was just a lack of knowledge with respect to the specifics uh, inherent in that Amazon opportunity. Um, and, and Hopefully, um, more education um, in the future will prevent that from happening again. Uh, I think our political leaders, uh, in some instances, were just not sufficiently aware of the specific circumstances and what the specifics of what was being offered to Amazon. What, what, is it, what does it mean for us, I mean, as the citizens of New York, when our leaders are not educated on the programs uh, that they were sort of fighting? You know, and when you were watching this and you were watching some of these politicians say, well, this is not fair to the, you know, the low-income families of those areas and so on. And when you were watching this and you, you saw that they were so wrong about it, uh, I mean, what can we do to change that as a group? I mean, as, uh, for, the, as the real estate, for the real estate industry, what can they do to educate the... Amir, we are a participatory democracy. And it's incumbent upon all of us to reach out to our political leaders and let them know exactly how you feel. Because by doing that, you will have an effect on their thinking and their reactions. 
and could they, it could change the it could it could make a huge difference in terms of how we function into the future. But New York is is, is hugely diverse, uh, and we have a a wonderfully well-educated population, and. The realities are we just need to participate to a greater extent to affect our, our livelihoods and our existence and our futures uh, beneficially. And, I mean, so I guess the only way most of us can participate is just by voting. But last week when we met, when I said you were very diplomatic and I asked you, I was like, if you could point the blame to one person who was responsible for that, you said it was uh, simply a lack of education on the, on the politicians. And that's a, that's a scary thought, you know, when the people who are supposed to be leading us are not familiar with the uh, policies and, uh, you know, the education they need to uh, sort of lead, lead policy for us. Which brings us to the next point. A few months ago, uh, you know, the state and the city were considering a peer to terror tax that sort of came out of nowhere, you know, and the industry had to group really fast to make sure that it didn't happen because a lot of people, especially in luxury residentials, which you're involved in, uh, would have been impacted in a serious way. And they said that the money, the tax money, is uh, for the MTA because the MTA is crumbling, but there was no plan in place, and yet they were ready to tax, you know, do the peer to terror tax, which would have slowed the market. And you're a businessman. You know that when the money comes in and you don't have plans for it, it gets spent on other things that you know, were you know, not always necessary. You, that policy is going to resurface again. I mean, how do we get around something like that where they're going to keep taxing and taxing the real estate industry on, uh, for everything that they need? The person who I'd say was probably most responsible was the sponsor of the legislation, Pat Hoylman. Um, he's very knowledgeable, very accomplished, um, highly educated, uh, and a person who I'd say has um, a superb comprehension of what's going on around him. Um, but in my conversation with Brad, uh, I told him what I thought would be the impact of the pay to tear tax, um, that it would be singularly unfortunate because the ramifications for it would produce a whole realm of, um, of consequences that were not intended. And for one, I told them there was, we had done studies uh, that would show that the tax, what they expected to achieve from it, uh, what would be nowhere near the amount uh, that they had postulated. Uh, and that was the basis for the legislation, number one. Number two, it would have a, a singularly negative impact on people who would be coming into New York to buy these pay to tears, to buy these second apartments, people from around the globe, people from around the country. And um, it's these people from a, who come into the metropolitan area of New York for a second home or whatever, who, who, who frequent the shops, who frequent the theaters, who like entertainment, who leave so much in the city by way of expenditures, which the city is dependent upon. And so to lose, to lose them uh, based upon a, not just a, a single tax, but a tax that would be enduring a tax that would repeat itself every year, a tax that was annualized. I said, made absolutely no sense at all. I said, could we, could we live with a pay to tear tax that's imposed at the time of the transaction? Possibly, probably. Could that be absorbed? Hopefully. Is it, is it beneficial to us? No. But if, if additional taxes are required, that could be a source of additional tax revenue. Not to the extent they believed they could achieve, which was, I think, 650 million. I think our number showed it's closer to 300 million. But the important thing is to make sure that if there's implementation of this concept in the future, a pay to tear tax, that it is not annualized. That is a killer. And that's, un that's, that's totally would produce unintended consequences that make no sense for, for any of us, including our legislative leaders.
Uh, I think a lot of people here are interested to know what projects uh, you're working on, and I'm going to go through some of them. And it's funny, as I'm going through this list, everything seems to be very big. And are you in a stage in your career where you feel like there has to be a certain amount of, uh, you know, it has, the deal or the project has to be at a certain amount for it to be worth your while? I'm sorry, a certain amount of? You, are you at a certain stage uh, in your career where you feel like every deal and every project that you do has to be at a certain amount for it to be worth your while? I wouldn't say everything has to be at a certain amount. It's just that we find ourselves gravitating to larger transactions that happen to be more complicated right. than smaller transactions. Why that is, I don't know, but it's a fact. And somehow, uh, considering where costs have gone, for some reason, costs never seem, to, never seem to go down. They always seem to go up. They always are on the increase. And so you look around today, and, uh, and everything seems to be in the billion-dollar category. Why that is, I can't quite explain. But the fact of the matter is, the larger buildings, uh, the larger transactions, um, have an allure that is unquestioned, um, and it makes for it makes for a incre significant increase in costs, significant financing, significant equity requirements. So it's one issue upon another upon another. The first of our buildings down the trade center was a billion. The second building was two billion. Tower three was three billion. Right. And if we do, t if we get the next one, Tower four, that'll be over four billion. Right. And so that's typical of what you're seeing in New York. For two World Trade Center, uh, you know, uh, News Corp was about to move into that. Uh, the Bjork Engels designed that for you. It was the last piece of uh, the, comp the, uh, the compound downtown. And uh, uh, News Corp, uh, you know, very famously, last minute, they pulled out of the deal. And uh, you mentioned that Rupert Murdoch called uh, you himself. And what was, that dis what was that conversation like? Because there was a lot of commitment, and they spent a fortune up to that point. So for them to pull out uh, was a big cost to them. So, so what, was, what was their thinking, and what, what was he saying to you? I, the, his call came to me, I think it was on Friday, the 15th of January, 2016. And Sounds like an anniversary. Pretty much. Uh, and uh, Rupert said, he said, Larry, I, he said, I know we've spent a lot of time together and I spent a pot of money. Um, he said, but I'm concerned about the state of the world at this moment. I don't like what I see in the economy. Uh, and I'm just hesitating as to the wisdom of spending all this money that I would have to spend if we make this move, as opposed to staying where we are. By staying where we are, I'm not gonna make, not gonna spend anywhere near that amount. And I could put that money into, uh, into our, that, take that capital and use it for our business purposes. And perhaps to, for better, for better. Uh, and so he said, I think I'm going to, I'm gonna pull the plug. And uh, I said, you know, Rupert, uh, You've spent a good deal of time and money. We've spent a good deal of time and also spent money. But at the end of the day, uh, your people, I think, all unanimously wanted to come down. And our people were happy to bring them down. He said, Larry, we worked together splendidly. Your team was wonderful. I said, your team was wonderful. He said, that's all true. Uh, he said, uh, and I said, but you know, so are you, is this something you really have considered fully? He said, I really have, and I'm just reluctant because of the state of the world and my concerns about where our economy is going. Now, you might remember, January of 2016 was not a very good time from the standpoint of economic activity. It looked like, from some perspectives, that we could be going back down into an abyss uh, from the standpoint of business activity and the economy in general. Uh, there was many signs of concern, uh, and, and there were some very serious questions as to what was happening, what was going to happen. And he was reading them negatively. Net result was, I said, Rupert, I said, considering everything, it's your right, of course, he, we gave him the right to pull up to a certain time frame, and that time frame, January of 2016, <laughs> he utilized at that moment in time. And so I said, look, Rupert, if this is your decision, 
then we're going to have to move on. So I just want to, want to be sure that I'm hearing you correctly. Have you made a definitive final decision? He said, we made, made a f definitive and final decision. We're not going to take the move. I said, okay, now we're going to, as you understand, we're going to move on. He said, I understand. He said, you do what you have to do. And so that's exactly what we did. Uh, it was unfortunate to lose and, it. And so now it remains on built. Uh, would you create some news here for all of us tonight? Would you, uh, today, would you consider uh, building two World Trade Center on spec without having an anchor tenant? I think the best answer to that is to um, read the papers, watch your TV stations, because news has a way of traveling. Uh, is, it, is, it a, is it a consideration? Of course it's a consideration. Um, you mentioned before that there is uh, a tremendous amount of uh, similarities between uh, you know, the World Trade Center site and the Hudson Yards area. Uh, what, are, what are those similarities, other than the fact that they're both new? You know, it's, um, we live in an incredible city. Uh, Steve Ross has done a fantastic job at Hudson Yards. We're fierce competitors and we fight like hell to achieve tendencies for, for our projects, our respective projects. But at the end of the day, um, when I looked at what Steve had accomplished, I told him it was fabulous and that he did a remarkable job and we should all applaud him for what he's accomplished. I think the, I think the, 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 one, okay, the one negative uh, is I think they're gonna have to deal with mass transit because I, I sense, I sense that that will be a, a, a problem for them in the future. Not so much of a problem today, but when that area gets fully built, they'll have to, have to find more transportation facilities available to them. Um, but at the end of the day, what's absolutely amazing, Steve has leased eight million square feet at Hudson Yards. At the same time, as we have leased eight million square feet at the World Trade Center. At the same time as Brookfields has leased four million square feet in Manhattan West. What other city in the world could accommodate 20 million square feet of new office space simultaneously? It's an amazing thing, absolutely amazing. And I think, I say, I say, I say to myself and I say to everybody else, we are blessed to be living in the city of New York. We are blessed to be New Yorkers, and we're blessed to have the good fortune of having this incredible city to work in and work with. Uh, both developments have really iconic uh, projects going up in them with amazing architects. Uh, what, why do you think that even though you are, uh, you know, the World Trade Center site ha is like, has its own hub for transportation, you guys manage to get rough, uh, you know, about 60, 70 percent of the rent that Hudson Yards is getting, and they don't nearly have the transportation uh, or the neighbor. And I hate to knock Hudson Yards because we're we are actually there. So, but uh, it's all. I also realize that it's a tough commute for people who get off on Seventh or Sixth Avenue and have to walk four or five avenues to you know to get to Hudson Yards, and that's a whole nother commute inside you know inside that project. Why do you think they managed to get more rent in rent than you guys did in the World Trade Center? I think New York has always suffered from a discount, right? Um, but it's my sense that in short order, um, certainly with respect to Tower Two. Considering what we've achieved to date, considering where the rents are now beginning to move up downtown, uh, I think you're going to see significantly higher rents achieved in Tower 2. Uh, and I think that's just a question of time and not much time. That's why I say stay tuned. Okay. Uh, what are the rents going to be in, for Tower 2? I'm sorry? What are the rents going to be for Tower 2? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. All right. <laughs> Well, you, you pretty much have your hands in all parts of the city, at least all the desirable parts of the city. So even though you're competing with uh, Hudson uh, Yards, you, also, you have a, you know, a very nice piece of land in and around Hudson Yards, right on 41st Street, which you were planning to do a 106-story uh, you know, condo project. And again, this goes back to you doing everything in a very large scale. I mean, a 106-story building in that area, uh, what's the plan for that uh, piece of land? 
when we get finished settling our issues with Amtrak and MTA, I'll be in a better position to be more specific. But I will tell you that um, deal, building in New York has all kinds of complexities, uh, not the least of which is what it, what's going on underground. And dealing with uh, MTA and dealing with uh, Amtrak uh, and dealing with the different agencies that have jurisdiction over what we do uh, is a, um, it's becoming a, a full-time employee, a full-time endeavor. It doesn't make it any easier, it makes it much you also, more. You also hire a lot of city people to come at you. you. also hire a lot of city people, city officials to come work for you to help you with the process. Well, I'm not sure which city official are you referring to. I got bad information, <laughs> don't worry. I just heard that you actually hire uh, like former city officials to work at Silverstein Properties to sort of help facilitate working with the MTA and you know, Port Authority and the different agencies. I don't, I don't believe that's the case. We do have, however, on staff, uh, people who are extremely knowledgeable, uh, have accomplished this mission for us in the past in other projects. Another, for example, one West End Avenue. Amtrak there as well, and uh, and it takes it just takes a huge amount of time to be able to work with the agencies, because for whatever reasons um, they like to do things uh, sequentially, we like to do things simultaneously. Yes. Sequentially extends the process uh, indefinitely. Simultaneously means you get it done much more quickly. So when it's, when, it's, when, it's, when it's my money, I want to move as quickly as I possibly can and therefore do things quickly and simultaneously. Whereas in a bureaucracy, there's no pressure, there's no time limitation. If it takes longer, so it takes longer because it's not their money. So, so is there a plan to build a 106-story condo in that? Is there a plan to build a 106-story condo in, on that lot at 521 West 41st? Stay tuned. Stay tuned, okay. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the outer boroughs. You're doing your first uh, major project there in Astoria. You're gonna build 4,000 apartments, from what I understand, uh, in Astoria. What, what, what's happening with that project? I think you're uh, exaggerating just slightly. My last count was 3,000, which isn't bad either. 4,000 would be better, but uh, what we're planning is rental housing uh, in that part of the city. Uh, the neighborhood is good. I think the neighborhood could accommodate it. I think residential rental housing in New York is terribly important. Uh, and so we're looking forward to that. We're just, we're in the very initial stages there, but that's a process uh, that will probably take 10 years to, to accomplish. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be around at that time, uh, but uh, it certainly is exciting to contemplate and uh, for all, the, all of our young people who are going to be functioning there and, and, and moving it forward, for them it'll be tremendously exciting and productive. Uh you're also, you've also started lending money out to other developers uh, with, your, with your fund. And one of the projects that you lent to was the tallest building in Brooklyn, which is going to be, uh, I, I believe, 10 DeKalb. And uh, Nine. Nine to, DeKalb. Michael, to Michael Stern for a tune of $500 million. Now, a loan like that, I mean, uh, do you vet a project like that yourself personally, or do you have your people do it? Or how, how does that work? Well. Whenever we're involved, we have our people involved, and that's the only way to do it, to make sure your people are right there. Um, in effect, there is, a, there is a, a, a lack of availability, or change it, there's a need uh, for financing um, that the banks are not in a position to do. Um, and it is, it is financing uh, that, again, larger projects more complex projects. This particular project at Nines of Cal will be Brooklyn's tallest. Uh, it is partial, partially residential, partially retail. The residents will be divided between rental apartments and condominiums, uh, retail and parking. So you've got that all in one structure. It also shows that you have a tremendous amount of confidence in the, in the developer, in Michael Stern, to lend him that kind of money. He's a, uh, he's a, 
a very accomplished uh, developer. Um, knowledgeable, uh, very capable, experienced, uh, doing a, an interesting range of projects in the city simultaneously. But there's a, there's a need for that, and um, we have, we, we've, that, we launched uh, Silverstein Capital Partners uh, with two major pension funds. Uh, and, and so we're moving forward, and I think over time, we'll end up probably putting a billion dollars to work in that regard. No, that's great. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, a, a while ago when we met, uh, you mentioned to me how a different commercial, uh, just the commercial real estate business was compared to today, naturally. Uh, you know, you were saying like how, uh, you know, people were buying, uh, leasing uh, uh, space for a quarter per square foot or like 50 cents or a dollar a square foot uh, when you had first started out. And then last week when we were walking through some of the uh, spaces at the World Trade Center, I was blown away by the designs that were being applied in today's commercial spaces. I mean, it, in my you know, thinking is that you get the space that you need and you use that space. And the spaces that, you know, I saw with your team, they're so massive and they give so much space for, you know, a company of like 80 people has, I don't know, like they had like 20,000, 25,000 square feet to work with. And the Diageo, the liquor company where you guys built a massive bar on the 76th floor, the 68th floor that went all through the space. I mean, those are incredible uh, sort of uh, demands and needs. And I know you're trying to get tenants down there. What are some of the crazy demands that tenants uh, ask of you guys? And are the tenants always right? You know, I don't know that they're crazy. Um, yes, they're, you call them demands. Um, I look at them as needs that, they, that they've got. Uh, and they express those needs in terms of the requests uh, that they give to us uh, for implementing the build out of their space. Um, and so in some cases, they, they want to do the build out themselves, which is fine. In other cases, we'll do the build out for them. Uh, it depends upon the nature of the transaction, how it works most easily for them and for us. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've got tendencies today uh, that are so vastly different from anything we conceived of uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's, it's just the change is nothing short of remarkable. And it's a reflection of, of the way we live today, the way we function today, uh, what, what the norms are, what the expectations are. And, and you also have, you know, coming back to the original question that you asked, today's, today's occupants are more dependent than ever on young people with technological skills in super abundance. Uh, and I look around us down at the Trade Center, there are something like 250,000 young skilled employees working down there in those buildings. And these are well-educated, highly, highly priced uh, people uh, with a diversity of backgrounds that they bring to their employers. Um, you've got a working element downtown that is much younger than it ever was before. The average age is 32 downtown. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, the truth of the matter is, I'm gonna digress for a moment. My wife and I have lived for uh, 34 years at 500 Park Avenue, Park Avenue, 59th Street. There, we were surrounded by people, a bunch of old fogies like us. I'm 88, my wife is 86, and how much, could you, how much time can you spend talking about golf scores? But for some reason, golf scores seems to be a, a, a discussion of very great importance to my age category. I don't know why, I don't play golf. My wife doesn't play golf either, but that's the point. But nevertheless, we saw the young people downtown in such abundance that we finally, when I had an opportunity, 
my wife said something else to me one day. She said, you know, you have such a concentration downtown, particularly in the World Trade Center. We ought to diversify. So I looked at her and I said, oh, interesting idea. Sure enough, a piece of land comes along, one block north of the Trade Center. And I said, diversify, great idea. I bought it. Came home that day and I said, sweetheart, we diversified. She said, what'd you buy? I told her. She said, where is it? I said, it's a block north of the Trade Center. She said, that's diversification? She didn't think that was very funny. But nevertheless, what do we do with the land? We decided to build a Four Seasons Hotel downtown because the only place you don't have a Four Seasons in New York is downtown. There's one in Midtown, but we needed another one downtown. So we built the Four Seasons Hotel downtown, and then we built the Four Seasons condos at the top. So we're up at the 80th floor now, right, of the Four Seasons condos. I have to tell you something. Most wonderful decision we could have made was to move downtown because we're surrounded by young people. There are young families filling the Four Seasons luxury condos. I don't know where the hell they get the money. I don't know, I don't know where that comes from. But somehow, they are there, they bought, these, they bought these condos that are not cheap. End of day, it's wonderful to be surrounded by baby carriages, by young children, by dogs, by pets of all kinds. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a vitality of life that exists down there that I don't see in the place we came from, which is 59th Street and Park Avenue. So uh, from, the standpoint, from the standpoint of longevity, I think it's good for longevity. From the standpoint of being surrounded by those young people, you get a perspective, you get a, a, a vision that is dr drastically, dramatically different from what we experienced up in other parts of the city. And so I will tell you, it's reflective of everything that's going on in this city a change, a massive change, particularly youthful, in the downtown area of, at the World Trade Center. Well, we're gonna slowly wrap up, but I wanted to ask some uh, sort of rapid questions from you. Uh, somebody wanted to know um, if you could redo, have a redo on one of the new developments that you've done, which building would it be and what would you do differently? Well, you know, it's, a, it's rare in life that you get a chance to build the same building twice. Now, that was made possible by, unfortunately, by 9-11, because the last building to come down on 9-11 was the original Seven World Trade Center. The first ones go up turned out to be Seven World Trade Center. When I finished the original Seven World Trade, I looked at the building. It was described by a, the architectural critic of the New York Times, Ada Louise Huxtable, who said, Mr. Silverstein built an office building downtown. It has all the allure of an oversized shoebox. I thought of that and I said, Jesus, I said, you know something, she's right. I looked at the building carefully and I decided, never build a building that isn't attractive, that isn't distinguished, that isn't the best it could be. In truth, the original Seven World Trade Center, I built to be able to produce space as cheaply as possible and be able to market it, therefore, to large space users. And sure enough, Solomon Brothers came in, took a million three hundred thousand square feet and out of a two million square foot total, and that, wrapped, that moved the building forward quickly and very successfully. But the truth is, it left me with a realization. In the future, the only things to do is build buildings that are attractive, that are the best they could be, that have, that, that have a positive impact on the community, right? And so when we did this trade center, first thing I did on the new seven was to bring in David Childs, and he designed a beautiful building for us, totally different. And he seems to be your go-to. I, I feel like you go to David Childs for a lot of things. Well, David Childs did the new seven for us. He did such a wonderful job there, I had him design one World Trade Center as well, which at the time we called the Freedom Tower. Today it's called One World Trade, right? I did a magnificent job with that. And then we brought in spectacular architects for towers four, three, and two. And so you've got uh, Fumi Komaki on, on Tower Four, one of, uh, a minimalist uh, out of Japan who did, does magnificent buildings, absolutely spectacular. But you've got to like minimalism. But I think 
four World Trade Center garnered every conceivable architectural award you could ask for. Then, of course, we went to uh, Richard Rogers for Tower 3. Same thing. Superb design, totally different from Tower 4. Not minimalist in any sense of the word. Again, achieved every architectural award you could possibly ask for. So, uh, Tower 2, first we went to Norman Foster, and then because of, of, uh, of uh, 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 Bjarke Engels did, did that at, at the request of uh, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and so, and again, you look, at the, look at the work uh, of Norman Foster around the globe, spectacular buildings. Look at the work of Bjarke Engels, young, very young, by the way, newly married, new child, right? He's going off in a totally different direction, which is great for him. But at the end of the day, terrific architecture, wonderful buildings. And that's, I think, a responsibility that we all have as developers to do the best we can, not the cheapest. And uh, finally, if you could pick one uh, residential building that you wish you had built, that's not yours, obviously, and one commercial building uh, that's not yours, which, uh, what address would they be? Which buildings would they be here in the city? I think um, if I was to choose a residential building, I think the building that Steve Roth has just completed at 240 Central Park South. 220, 220 is, Central Park South. Right. Superb, superbly done. He, did, he, 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 he spent a huge amount of time, effort, energy on making that building the best he could possibly do. Uh, not necessarily for architecture, but for... for, for and, and he's getting the prices for it, so... And, and, it, and it's, it's doing very well with the selling of that. In terms of office buildings, I look back to Mies van der Rohe and his building at 375 Park Avenue, the Seagram's building. I still think that's one of New York's most classic and magnificent buildings for all time. Well, Larry, thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure. Thank you for what you did in downtown and everything else.